Thank you, Cornelia, and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today to discuss such an important issue facing financial markets. As Cornelia said, um, I'll just briefly discuss um, some of the steps that people can take to start to prepare for transition as set out in the Global IBOR Benchmark Survey. So, a short introduction to ICMA before I begin. So, we are a trade association promoting resilient, well-functioning, international and globally coherent cross-border debt securities markets. We have members including private and public sector issuers, financial intermediaries, asset managers, other investors, capital market infrastructure providers, central banks, law firms, and others worldwide. And we've been focusing on benchmark reform and transition for many, many years now. We're pleased to be a non-voting member of the working group on Euro risk-free rates. And we're also participating in the working groups uh, in the UK uh, and the Swiss area and staying in touch with our members worldwide, as you might expect. So it's clear from the presentations we've heard today and previous remarks um, that there is a need for all market participants to prepare for benchmark transition. This view has also been expressed by regulators in the US and the UK and elsewhere in the context of LIBOR. Benchmark transition will therefore involve a global effort across multiple jurisdictions, currencies, and products. It's going to be quite a challenge. And we all have a part to play in this transition. It's very important that market participants inform themselves of the various issues and start to prepare. And it's a great step that you're all here today. So in June this year, ISDA, AFMI, SIFMA, SIFMA AMG, and ICMA published an IBOR Global Benchmark Transition Report with the help of EY. The report is publicly available on all of our websites, and I do encourage you to read it, along with the uh, transition roadmap uh, that was published um, just before the report. So the report contains information obtained from a survey of buy and sell side institutions in the cash and derivatives markets, both wholesale and retail, financial in entities, corporate entities, other end users, infrastructure providers, and law firms. So it's pretty broad ranging. And it was intended to gauge the state of market readiness and identify the challenges and potential solutions for an orderly, efficient, and coordinated transition. The report highlights the need for market participants to take immediate action. With every new IBOR or EONIA trade executed, the extent of the market's reliance on those benchmarks increases and the transition challenge increases. The report provides a detailed implementation checklist that you can use to track your progress towards benchmark transition. And there are five elements in that checklist, which I'll just briefly describe now and are up on the slide. So first, establish a formal transition program. This is likely to involve appointing a senior executive to manage a multi-year transition program, establishing a robust governance structure for the program, allocating budget, confirming staffing needs, defining your program work streams, and initiating internal stakeholder education. And to be clear, this is likely to involve multiple teams across your businesses. In the case of international businesses, that will be a global effort. Second, assess your exposure to affected benchmarks. So this is likely to involve developing an inventory of products, financial instruments, and contracts linked to affected benchmarks quantifying the exposure to those benchmarks across core business lines and products, and calculate that exposure that's anticipated to roll off prior to key dates 2019, 2020, and 2021. And then evaluate your operations by assessing the impact on processes, data, and importantly, technology. You might also want to implement internal reporting, to monitor your exposure to affected benchmarks throughout the transition period. Now, the third step is to analyze your contracts. Someone mentioned earlier that um, transition might um, 
involve lawyers to the uh, lowest extent possible. I think here, perhaps, it's obvious that we may need to involve lawyers to some degree. Um, you'll need to in involve um, your lawyers to review existing contracts to assess the status of your current fallback provisions by product and contract type and determine where contracts require repapering. So as we've heard today, Euribor is in the process of being reformed, but in the meantime, sufficient, sufficient safeguards should be established in all contracts to mitigate the risk of potential adverse scenarios. And indeed, in some cases, the benchmark regulation requires this. The Eyeball Global Benchmark Transition Report also notes that involvement with industry working groups, for example, via trade associations, should also be considered. The fourth point is to consider your communication with external parties. So this might involve developing a communication strategy for clients and identifying external parties that need to be involved in your firm's transition. So this might involve, for example, your technology vendors. They might need a significant lead time to update their systems that they provide to you, for example. Last but not least, the suggestion is that you define a transition roadmap. This is likely to involve developing an implementation plan with key projects, milestones, and responsibilities. You might also wish to consider keeping up to date with OSSG and RFR working group publications. We've heard a lot today about the focus on transparency in the Euro area, and I think the other working groups in other jurisdictions would also take that approach as well. You can find minutes of working group meetings, for example, on the ECB website, Bank of England website, ARC website, etc. You might also wish to think about contributing to the demand for, design of, and training in new products that reference alternative RFRs, such as ESTA, in due course. So to conclude, the IBOR Global Benchmark Transition Report sets out a useful implementation checklist that individual market participants can use in their benchmark transition planning. Market participants are being strongly encouraged to prepare actively for benchmark transitions. In the words of Benoit Coure, financial market participants, on their part, should redouble their efforts to ensure a smooth transition. And time is running short. Thank you. Mr. Bertrand de Mazier, Director General of Finance from the EIB. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, indeed, I'm uh, Director General for Finance for the European Investment Bank, meaning that I'm in charge of the funding, uh, liquidity management, uh, back office, middle office, uh, asset liability management of this uh, of this institution. I'm actually also a board member of ICMA, so I'm quite happy to, to speak after a representative of this excellent association. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to, uh, to be invited to speak here today. Uh, it's a pleasure that is, I must say, tainted with some angst because I'm conscious to be your last obstacle to your weekend preparation. So I, I'll, try to be, I'll try to be brief. Uh, I'm sure that a lot of you are cringing now because when somebody says I'll be brief, usually it's the other way around. Uh, but I'll try to keep up to my promise. Um, the European Investment Bank is, uh, is an invited member of the uh, Euro uh, Risk Free Rate uh, Working Group. Uh, and as such, I must say that uh, it has, uh, it has uh, witnessed uh, considerable progress in the global thinking about uh, this question of rate succession and benchmark succession. Uh, at the same time, it's certainly a program, an adventure that is still in the making, that is still full of unknowns and uncertainties. And I would say that the main message I will start with is that these uncertainties are not a reason not to do anything, that actually we are now, we've made progress enough to start now to prepare actively. And that I, uh, that I would like to do today is to explain as a market practitioner, market 
member like the EIB is uh, starting to uh, uh, get ready to prepare for uh, for this uh, transformation. So in my oh no, it's not that one. Uh, so in my presentation today, uh, I will uh, first of all uh, share a few ideas about the, um, let's say, the, um, the analysis of uh, interdependencies, the analysis of the, of the field play that we have to, to work with. And then uh, I'll give you some, some uh, ideas of what we are doing, or what we've done, and maybe also what we still have to do, what we haven't done yet. And then uh, I'll uh, uh, give you a, a, a bit of more focus on one of the things we've done, which is uh, uh, nations, uh, recent issues uh, of a GBP uh, Sonia uh, floating rate note. Um, so first of all, I think it's very important to uh, to start analyze. Uh, when we, you start working on, on, on the, uh, how to get ready and how to prepare, to start looking at the interdependencies. As, as a bank, we basically, we are financial intermediary, so we channel, uh, we, we channel money from agents uh, in financial surplus, typically the investors who buy uh, EIB bonds, in our case, to, uh, to agents, economic agents, uh, who are in financial deficit, uh, typically our uh, private sector and public sector borrowers. And of course, if our investors, for example, don't follow uh, the developments in the interest rate benchmarks, and if they continue to, to prefer buying instruments that refer to old benchmarks, it's not going to incentivize us as an issuer to work actively on this succession. So uh, certainly we have to have an interaction, educative interaction with investors to, uh, in order to promote the issuance of bond referencing the new benchmarks and to actively explore market solutions to deal with the legacy uh, bonds that would refer to old benchmarks. Similarly, uh, with our borrowers, if they don't start themselves to prepare for the transition to the new benchmark, it's not going to help us either as a lender, it's not going to help us to initiate the discussions that we need to have with them at some point to amend our existing loan contracts and to actively explore the opportunity of introducing to them new reference rates lending uh, contracts. And uh, we also need uh, actually interaction and the collaboration of market infrastructures because if they don't innovate and they don't develop alternative hedging solutions, it's not going uh, to help us to make progress and to help the market community to uh, be steered out of the old benchmark. Similarly, we need industry associations and working groups to uh, elaborate and formulate uh, practical solutions, workable solutions to smoothen the transition. We, we need the regulators and legislators. Uh, we, uh, we need them to uh, take into account the practical constraints that the stakeholders, the market practitioners are facing for an orderly transition. Uh, it's very interesting for regulators to avoid any way chaos and, and uh, to uh, uh, smooth to, to have a smooth transition, and we may need them to set rules for this transition and to uh, make rules for the statements of discontinuation, for example. Uh, one last two words on this analysis of uh, interrelationships uh, and interdependencies. Uh, first of all. Uh, Regulators and legislators have said that this process should be market-driven and, and driven by market practitioners, which is very good and in a way, thanks to the uh, associations and working groups, uh, markets are indeed able to, to develop a lot. But we will need the guidance of regulators anyway, and I, what is very important is that these guidances from the agent, from the associations, and from the regulators converge, converge harmoniously. And, in, and, and for that, I must say that this uh, 
working group is, is a very important uh, forum that certainly is still needed. The other thing I would like to say is that um, the, the level of preparation is still very unequal. And there is, even today actually, the composition of this audience shows it. There is an angle that is not yet much engaged into the process, which is basically the corporates, especially the smaller ones, and even more the retail clients. And that makes me think that this kind of event has to be repeated in the, uh, in the future. And actually, we discussed, I discussed that briefly with you, Cornelia, and with Benoit, who, who is already starting his recent preparation, maybe, because we, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but uh, we, we should repeat this event and perhaps decline these events, capitalizing on the existence of a network of national central banks and also a network of national relays of the industry associations to really be able to engage more with the, the SMEs uh, and with the retail uh, clients. Uh, to give you an example, we are monitoring already uh, the demand for our clients, and at the moment, those clients who are speaking were asking EIB about new rates, new, new reference rates for the continue. It's actually only a handful of them. Uh, so, so definitely, there's, there's still work to do. Now that I've explained all these, uh, all these uh, interdependencies, uh, let's turn to, to what we've. Uh, tried to do already at, at, my, uh, at my institution. Uh, first of all, uh, we, uh, we did what uh, the SCMA uh, did as well. So we started to uh, list all the uncertainties and all the unknowns. And it's, 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 it's a work that can be a bit discouraging at the beginning. And I can tell you that I heard some of my colleagues on not only at the EIB actually, but also outside, uh, basically saying, why the hell are we doing all that? It was working so well. We know since, on, on, and it was explained this morning, that it was not working that well, and actually it was working well on the very dodgy foundations, and that now we are working to something that will be much better founded. But nevertheless, it is true that the listing of unknowns is something that is a bit uh, formidable, on the first uh, outlook, but needs to, needs to be done. Actually, once it's done, it's relatively reassuring because conceptually, the, the, the list is, is easy to, to grasp. So on the basis of this list that I'm not going to, uh, to, to repeat, um, we uh, then started to work. And to be fair, we starting to work not so long ago. Uh, if only because some of the uncertainties were too uncertain, uh, uncertain until a few months ago. So we, we, we started basically uh, at the beginning of this year, in February, to set up a, 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 a project under uh, the responsibility of the Asset Liability Committee. There's an Asset Liability Committee at the EAB, like in every, uh, I would say, in every bank. I'm, I'm the chair of this ALCO. And all the services mainly impacted by this evolution uh, are now embarked into a special ALCO project uh, where we look at all these angles. The first thing we did, and we've done that, uh, I would say we've done three quarters of that, so it's, uh, it's, it's, but it's very important, I think, to start with it, is to measure our current exposure in economic terms to the different uh, interest rate benchmarks. Uh, so it's, 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 a, it's a, mapping, a mapping exercise, actually, where per currency, where per rate, Per maturity, we 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 figure uh, the gross uh, nominal uh, exposure, uh, the gross outstanding nominal amount. I would say. Uh, what is interesting is then to get to a second level, which is the measure of a net outstanding. Uh, amount which we are still working on, but the gross has been done already. The gross mapping has been done already, 
And uh, in the main, uh, at the same time, we've already conducted uh, an assessment of the existing fallback provisions that we have already in our contracts for the different asset and liability classes. Now, uh, in terms of action plan, we have uh, divided our internet, our project into five work streams. Uh, which are more or well advanced, uh, and uh, which I will now uh, describe a little bit more. Whereas one work stream is a bit evident, it's the monitoring of key developments. Uh, so we just have, a, we have a, some sort of a, a control tower team uh, that is monitoring what's going on in the various uh, markets. Uh, it's a continuous process that is time consuming, but absolutely necessary. And we also uh, value analysis, uh, we value the opportunity to be part of uh, different working groups, which are excellent opportunities to discuss and share information. There's a business, business work stream. Uh, on the funding side, we, uh, we uh, actually uh, explore the possibility to issue bonds that refer to new benchmarks. We did that in June uh, in GBP, and I will uh, turn back to that later on. We also uh, look, uh, listen to uh, what uh, various working groups are proposing or starting to propose for the management of legacy bonds, referencing to old benchmarks. Uh, in our case, I must say that this is a risk that is of a limited size, fortunately, but there is still a few uh, floating rate nodes that have a, let's say, maturity beyond 21. On the lending side, we are currently concentrating our efforts on introducing uh, fallback provisions in our master lending contracts. And, uh, to, uh, uh, and beyond that, we know that we will have to enter then a phase of bilateral discussion with, with clients in case of discontinuation of some of these indices. And before entering this uh, negotiation phase, that what we should do probably, and we have not done uh, that yet, is to establish, to, to prepare a communication strategy to our clients, to, to, to already uh, put them into, into uh, to, to tell them how we're going to proceed and why we're going to proceed. Um, on the treasury and asset liability management side, while well, it's mostly uh, market monitoring, monitoring uh, hedging solution, uh, we are looking at uh, we are looking forward to uh, the conclusions of the ISDA consultation on fallback provisions and on protocol on legacy trade. So at the moment, it's more, uh, I would say, it's more um, monitoring than, than uh, else. We, uh, we are also, there's another work stream on the valuation, uh, the risk management, the valuation, and the accounting of uh, uh, um, and the impact uh, on these fields of the new uh, um, uh, reference rates. The introduction of new reference rate benchmarks actually will introduce new types of positions, new types of interest rate basis that we haven't been exposed so far and that are actually naturally ignored by our risk uh, management framework. So we have to, we have to adapt these risk management frameworks. Um, we, we have also to prepare for, uh, the, uh, for changes or evolutions in the way uh, instruments uh, like interest rate derivatives will be valued. So we've started already internal discussions about that. We will have to also adapt our fund transfer system, fund, fund transfer pricing system uh, to uh, these new uh, interest rates uh, and to uh, price. We will have to prepare the pricing of our loans to the measurement of the contribution of our, new, of our different activities in case 
of a, perm of a permanent decontinuation of some of the benchmarks we're using today. On the legal and documentation uh, side, we are uh, at the moment uh, mostly monitoring what market is developing in terms of market standards. And finally, there's a work stream which is data on IT applications. At this moment, it's too early for us to embark into a detailed plan on our IT systems, IT systems, but we have already earmarked in our budget planning for uh, 2019. Uh, we've already earmarked actually a, a budget for 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 uh, um, accommodation of our IT systems to new. Uh, interest rate benchmarks. This actually uh, makes me uh, say that all this requires at some level, and I'm sure it's the case with you, an engagement of our uh, governance. Uh, so this mapping, for example, that we've done of our uh, risk exposures is, is some, something that we are informing our management of, and, and of course we are exposing them to the need of, for example, uh, setting up a budget uh, contingency for uh, uh, invest IT investment in 2019. Now, uh, I'm almost done, uh, and I'll just say a few words of one of the highlights of the thing we've done so far, which is this uh, issuance of uh, Sonia Floater. Uh, it's actually a project we started last year. So it's been a long project to develop and uh, probably and hopefully uh, now that the markets be become more and more attuned to the reality that benchmarks will change, probably will be quicker for other new experiments. But these experiments with Sonia started with us in April 2017 and came uh, in realization to, to full realization only, uh, I would say, one year, one year later. Uh, I, I think we'll be quicker for uh, Nesta, uh, for uh, not Nesta, sorry, a uh, trail. But to, sorry for that. But to um, to to ensure this uh, successful check and let's say trade with a new interest rate, we had to engage actually with market practice market constituents from the public side we had to discuss with the Bank of England for the if only for the repo eligibility with the FCA with the UK DMO with the investors with banks with industry working groups and we did that in two stages we first did a quasi lab experiment it was a two million only uh, issuance in March it was a five-year floating rate note and uh, then we looked at how it went. Actually, we discovered a very interesting questions. For example, the repo eligibility of this bond was legally absolutely impeccable, but the systems did not allow it mm -hmm. because the system did not provide for the possibility to recognize the existence of a Sonia floating rate node. So this is very interesting to discover, but it's better to discover that on a, a lab size exercise, and so this very small issuance. And then we, uh, so when uh, we, thanks to this experiment, we were more or less sure that our system, but also other system could handle the trade properly, that the paying agent could run a coupon calculation properly, that the investors could book the transaction and value the bond properly, that the bond could be repoed properly, that the deal structure was actually meeting market uh, demand. We did this full size new issuance, a five year issuance, uh, with a specificity of paying coupons linked to Sonia and not to LIBOR. And we had to make choices, and we made the choice that these coupons uh, are quarterly and set equal to the compounded daily Sonia with a five day lag. And this uh, seems to have served as some sort of uh, market reference to, to other issuers since then. I'll stop there. I hope I'm up to my promise of being not too, not too long. Um, it's been a very interesting day, I must say. Uh, again, regulators worldwide are telling us that this reform should be market-led. 
uh, this will succeed only if we all prepare for it. And uh, here, I think this room is full of people who are rather well prepared, but we still have to work with others as well. Thank you very much.